Sure. Right, guys, welcome back to another episode of Move, Breathe, Live. Uh, today, I'm pretty, well, I'm well stoked to welcome a slightly uh, different sort of guest. Uh, normally, obviously, we're talking to people who are in the movement, breathing kind of sphere and that kind of thing. But today, probably talking to someone who's moved and breathed and lived a hell of a lot more of a life than any of us really have. Um, welcome, Charlie Walker. Thanks very much. That was a very nice introduction. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so before we get started, like I think the easiest thing to do is I could uh, try to remember everything you've done, um, but perhaps you can just briefly uh, introduce yourself as with a, a bit of a rundown of all of the crazy things that you've managed to do in your, I mean, how old are you now? Uh, about to be 35. You're about to be 35. Okay. You're a few years younger than me. So in your uh, 34, nearly 35 years, all of the experiences you've had. So not all of them, let's not go too crazy, too deep, too quickly, but <laughs> an overview. <laughs> sure. Well, I guess to uh, pracy as succinctly as possible, um, when I was uh, in my early 20s, I set off on a bicycle and I spent four and a half years pedaling um, 43,000 miles or 70,000 kilometers um, across Europe, Asia and Africa uh, with the goal to get to the furthest point uh, or cape in each of those continents. So Nordcap up at the top of Europe, Singapore down at the southeast of Asia and then Cape Agulhas down at the bottom of Africa, the southernmost point just close to Cape Town. Um, so that involved cycling across the Sahara a couple of times uh, through Tibet in winter, which was cold Fresh. and lonely and challenging. <laughs> um, through Iran twice, Afghanistan. Um, I chose to hike from Beijing to Mongolia on that journey, which is about a thousand miles, um, as I'd cycled that a few years earlier. And then I bought a horse and rode, well, tried to ride that for a couple <laughs> of months across uh, across the sort of the central area of Mongolia on the, the steppe, the grasslands. Then uh, when I was in DRC or the Congo, um, a friend and I uh, spent a month paddling um, a dugout canoe or a pirog, essentially a hollowed out tree trunk, down a, um, down a, a river, a tributary of the Congo, which was probably the more dangerous and sort of fraught uh, part of that long journey. Um, since that bicycle ride, um, I have spent eight months traveling the length of the geographical border between Europe and Asia, or the perceived border, um, by ski uh, through the Ural Mountains, kayak down the Ural River, and then cycle from Kazakhstan to Istanbul. Um, so that was about 5,000 miles, a little bit more. Um, I've hiked and rafted across Papua New Guinea. I've climbed an unclimbed mountain in Kyrgyzstan. And earlier this year, I spent two months hiking uh, about 600 miles um, through uh, Arctic Siberian winter, temperatures down to the uh, deep minus 40s, um, hiking along frozen rivers and then the frozen Arctic Ocean along the sort of on the ocean along the coast. Um, and unfortunately, at the end of that journey, I was arrested um and yeah. stuck in a in a prison for about a month um because russia changed quite a lot in the course of my time there um so yeah that brings us up to now yeah i mean i think uh anyone probably listening is uh probably realizing that they've probably not done a huge amount um in relation to a lot of that <laughs> um and i mean it's almost a bit like you know where on earth do, do you start kind of diving into all of that i guess to begin with uh the we'll start of your bike journey because i've just read your two books um well i've audio booked them in all fairness um which you also read which does help um but you kind of start off as what seems like a, a rather like innocent uh naive young man um <laughs> and the thing i love about how it starts is i kind of feel it's how i would almost um start i.e you kind of almost drunkenly said uh yeah i'm gonna go and cycle all of this and then you just stuck to it yeah um i mean it sort of began and i suppose with hindsight i'm a little uh, a little uh, embarrassed about this but it sort of began with essentially a homeric post you know i kind of got drunk in a in a wood in siberia um uh, sitting around a campfire and said oh, i'm gonna cycle right i just done my first short bike tour 
I'm going to cycle right the way across, you know, like around the world or whatever. I, I sort of, you know, I didn't yet know exactly what the the the, the sort of route or concept would, yeah. would be, but I just knew that I wanted to go away on a bike for a very long period of time over a very big distance. Um, and I am quite stubborn. So I, uh, I ended up going through with it. And there are a lot of times when I thought, well, you know, this is, this is absurd, but that's also somewhat a flippant answer because I, I had been for several years by that point, I suppose, slowly building up to the idea of doing something large. You know, I'd read a lot of books by different explorers and kind yeah. of had always wanted to emulate the idea of a, a grand journey, you know, the sort of the, you know, an odyssey, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, I've kind of, in my head, I've kind of been starting to do something similar. And, you know, I feel like, well, these things are always easier, I feel, when you're younger, because freedom um, in your 20s and stuff is much easier than having houses and wives and dogs and stuff like that. But, um, um, yeah, I guess when you started all of that and you've obviously taken this like, yeah, sorry, I'm going to go and I can tour the world on my bike. Um <sighs> even with your little sort of bits of touring and bits of exploring that you've done, could you have even remotely um, fathomed, I guess, some of the lows that maybe you, you might come across? Because as you say, you, um, well, through Tibet, you kind of managed to, we'll come on to in a bit, but you kind of nearly managed to kill yourself in a snow drift, essentially. Um, and then being, attacked with stones in i want to say somalia but yeah, i might yeah. be wrong yeah okay it's yeah, it yeah. yeah that's right you know all of these bits and pieces where kind of and one of the things i really want to go into a little bit is the idea of like loneliness i guess and being alone and, and, and finding times when it's probably amazing and it's probably peaceful and you know under the stars but after four years does is that a you know well, before four years, is that even remotely possible to think of how low you can go at those times? But at the same time, is it even possible after four years to really enjoy those moments, I guess? Like in maybe in the first few weeks and stuff, when you find a really peaceful spot, you might be like, oh, this is amazing. Um, um, it, yeah, it's a really good question. And I, I suppose, honestly, before I left, before I started this journey, I... I kind of had considered and knew that there would be that there would be plenty of of low points you know there would be difficult times but I think I still viewed those through the kind of lens of excitement and romanticism I knew that I'd be more exhausted than I'd ever been before yeah, and that I'd yeah. be more alone than I'd ever been before and that I would you know get ill in interesting places and get you know attacked in scary places and you know, that all kind of just lent itself, I suppose, to the excitement of the journey when it was abstract. But once it was real, of course, it's a very different thing. And loneliness was the big one that like, over the course of years, I slowly learned how to deal with. Um, and there's no hack, there's no short kind of you know solution to that. It really comes from making sure that you want to be doing what you're doing mm -hmm. and remembering that you want to do it. Um, and I suppose also it, I felt less lonely when it was, so I, I wasn't cycling especially fast to, to put yeah, it in yeah. context. People who go off and cycle, I mean, the fastest round the world trip, for instance, Mark Beaumont a few years back, I think he was averaging something like 280 miles a day. I was over the course of the whole trip, including days off and everything, I was averaging something like 30 miles a day, you know, right. really not very much. I was taking my time. Uh, and that was, you know, very much the goal was the, the bike was a means to an end. I wasn't racing. Yeah, yeah. But when I was going quite slowly, that's when it would, it, it, I felt more, I was more liable to fee, feel lonely when going quite slowly. When I had a sort of a mission, I, oh, I've got a visa deadline that I'm chasing. Mm -hmm. Then I didn't because you'd cycle all day. And at the end of the day, you'd pass out in your tent. You're just so relieved to not be sitting on a saddle. Um, yeah. you know, presumably on a crop of saddle sores by that point, yeah. that you feel that you feel kind of fine. And again, you know, it's sort of, I suppose this is almost a bit hackneyed now, but it's definitely in the more populous places that I felt more lonely when yeah, I was yeah. in mountains and deserts and then, you know, tens or even hundreds of miles from anyone else. Uh, then I, 
don't I don't think I particularly did struggle with loneliness so much at those times. Do you think that's uh, something I may I mean I don't know it's kind of hard isn't it but is that do you think that's something about when you are tens of miles from or hundreds of miles from anywhere from anyone and anywhere but you're kind of in you're in that nature I guess and you kind of maybe feel your the how small you are compared to like just the world then actually it's kind of you kind of puts you in your place and you're a bit like you can find yourself within it a bit more exactly that there's a I, I guess not to sound too wanky but there's a sort of majesty to to, to solitude in wild yeah, yeah. places um you know the there's there's a sort of um you know it's, it's quite sublime being in the mountains mm-hmm. by yourself and being able to shout and hear your voice echo off yeah you know valley after valley after valley stretching dozens of miles and knowing that no one's hearing it except you and a bunch of marmots um <laughs> and marmots. when you're yeah but if you're lonely in a place where there are lots of people and you don't feel particularly able to communicate with anyone yeah or able to you know particularly in more um affluent countries you know i was usually in in more or less the, de- the developing world for want of a mm-hmm. better term but um you know going through parts of europe for instance just felt a little bit different because there are a bunch of people but i suddenly felt more disconnected from them than i would have from people in a african village for example because i was on such a skin flint budget that i couldn't buy into the sort of society if that makes any yeah, sense yeah, i couldn't yeah. really stop for a for a coffee because it would cost a day's budget you know, yeah. things like that to just build a distance and then with that as well because you know one of the things that you really come across apart from I, want to, I might say Ethiopia again, I can't quite remember, but you essentially, or no, was it, actually it was just South Africa, sorry, I think, but um, you basically, especially when you were going through Africa, even through Mongolia, through all of everything out east, you know, you would get put up left, right and centre, do you know what I mean? Like, you know, we, we touched on the being in Tibet and you're nearly killing yourself, at, you know, or you didn't nearly kill yourself, the weather nearly killed you, but um but, you know, you kind of got out of that and then you got put up by a little old man or a little family in their hut. And throughout most of the world, I guess it's really when they've, I don't know, it's again, it's that cliche thing of those with the least tend to want to give the most. And then, you know, if you're in Europe or a more Western world, I guess people are probably just a bit more, um, well, they've got plenty. They don't need to give. Do you know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah, well, it's 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 this strange. It's really counterintuitive, but the more people have, and this is a, a, a pretty decent rule of thumb for across the world, and I think I think it's pan societal. Yeah, the more people have, the more they want to protect mm-hmm. it. Um, which you know, it's ironic. I mean, I, I, you could take that to extremes, and you know, the people who earn hundreds of millions of dollars or pounds or euros every year tend to pay next to nothing in yeah, tax, tax whereas people people who earn you know uh, average national income in the uk is about twenty eight thousand pounds a year pay all the tax because there's no there's no means by which to not and i don't yeah. think they rail against it whereas people who are earning unreasonable sums that there is simply no need or use for um will begrudge you know you know even minuscule percentages so yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's an unusual. Um, it, it doesn't make sense, but it does seem. To I definitely. Carry. I mean, I travel. I I travelled through India for six months, um, like eight years ago, and I definitely found the same thing. I mean, I remember the first day I even arrived and walking down the, this beach, and this little old lady just started chatting to me in sort of her, you know, best English that she had type thing. And, um, you know, come back shy, come back shy, and you know, I went back to her house. This was literally my first day arriving in India and you know I always my wife and I always laugh at this for one I, it was a bit of a shock when I got off the airplane got picked up in the taxi and as I pulled out there was a man just taking a dump on the side of the road that was a an eye-opener for a slightly different world but then this lady just took me into a house and it was literally like four walls like tiny little roof no lights you know just a couple of windows um, a bed pushed up against the wall um, and had like her, her husband and two kids in there. And, you know, they would just have tea, you know, like wanting me to have a cup of tea. And it was, yeah, a real, wow, it's a different experience. Yeah, I mean, I I, I also, I, I feel like I, I want to slightly temper what I just said, because people are extremely friendly and kind and welcoming, even in, you know, more mm-hmm. you know, wealthy countries. It's just that there's barriers that life and wealth and yeah. also i suppose uh societal Culture. infrastructure builds around people's lives 
yeah um you know like right now it's I mean, it's a hot evening and i'm you know sitting up in the loft um sweating Swelling. and silently drinking water every time you talk whereas in most other countries people in this sort of weather would be sat out on the street watching the world go by and mm-hmm. um we we do live and, and and this is partly because i'm you know on a on a computer but this is also because you know we don't have a space out the front you know it's 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 not it's just a, it's just a very different sort of approach to yeah, yeah. life um and yeah. the more gated your sort of existence is the less likely you are to just encounter or you know interact with other people strangers yeah yeah absolutely um all right so you decide to go off cycling now uh did you put any preparation work in obviously you've been doing you know you've gone and done your uh little cycle that you've done that could decide that you're going to do it but you know any training any any thoughts anything just like now nah, sort of just jump on because i know you also your bike uh old jeff um was what 100 quid uh, I think I think it's 112 pounds. Something. 112 pounds. So not exactly a performance bit of kit. No, uh, it, it was. To be fair, it was secondhand and new. I think it would have cost about 300 pounds. So you know, <laughs> a little bit better. Um, but I mean, I didn't need a good bike for it. Um, I didn't train at all. Um, the first couple of days were the only days where I had a bit of a, a <clears throat> excuse me, a bit of a necessity to cover a sort of a certain distance because i had to hit the f- sort of free ferry crossing that the ferry company had given me right uh, so so i think the first day i ended up cycling about 95 miles on hilly roads in southern england and that was having not cycled more than probably 30 miles in a day for, <laughs> for you know for over a year yeah or around a year um so no i didn't train the, the only thing i really did by way of preparation was saving money um raising a little bit further money with sponsorship from a company, mm. um, making a little website, and it's kind of it. I didn't, I didn't get a single visa before I left. I didn't plan the route. But I just had the kind of the outline of where I wanted to get to and the places in between. I'd figure out as I went along. Um, so yeah, the, the planning really was just kind of raising. Get on and do it. Exactly. Yeah. Nice. I mean, I quite like that idea. I think that's a. Uh, it's very one of the guy. I'm obviously the guy. I had a guy called Nick Butter. I don't know if you know, you've heard of Nick Butter, but yeah, first guy runner. to run. Yeah. And I obviously had him on and his 192 marathons in 192 countries obviously was the total opposite and had to be planned to the, you know, as best as possible to the nth degree. But I love the idea that like essentially freedom, you know, you know, you want to go here, here and here and actually what, what's the, going to be the best roads to take? Well, we'll just, we'll just go and see what happens. And, you know, it kind of also leaves you that um, possibility of finding kind of friendship, love, whatever else on the travels while you're, while you're at it too. Um, yeah. Did you, throughout, in particular, the first book, so your first book kind of takes you um, from home to essentially Beijing. to the north, all the way to Singapore, and then it brings you, I can't Up quite remember. Beijing. Yeah, to Beijing, that's right. Yeah. Um, so in that, it kind of, you know, maybe because it's more Western and that maybe that's a more travelled route, but you seem to have come across a lot more people and, and also kind of, I'm not saying love, let's say, as such, but there was definitely elements of, you know, you met some women and at times there was kind of, I don't know, like, yeah, there was, I guess, love and there was kind of relationships built through that. Did you know, in your, in, in your head, in those situations, does that kind of drive a, obviously that's a personal relationship, whereas kind of in what you're doing, it's almost like a, it's like a personal to yourself. Like, this is what I want to do. Was there ever like a tearing of your own kind of thought process? Or, oh, I don't really want to commit to being too friendly with people. Cause I don't, you know, this is my thing that I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah, I was, um, particularly for the first sort of year or so I was really blinkered even mm. even in the sort of day to day I sort of had I suppose at the back of my mind a sense of progress and head down and I wanted to see and visit the places I was going to but I think yeah. it was about a year in that I in a in a greater sense kind of slowed down that little bit more 
and opened my eyes that little bit more and felt able to kind of linger whimsically that little bit more, you know, yeah. as opposed to, and, and, and a lot of that was due to, you know, the fact that during the first year, the first three months I was in the EU, but after yeah. that, um, I was up against sort of visa constraints for, for much of the time. Um, yeah. so head, heading through Turkey, I only had one month. Heading across Iran, I only had one month. Through India, the same. China, I only had three months to cover a huge distance. And then down through Southeast Asia, which is where I started to slow down a little bit, um, I still had these kind of visa constraints. Whereas in after that, I seem to find and I don't know if it's by coincidence or if I've managed to sort of engineer things this way but I found myself spending more time moving slowly across larger countries um and that that probably helped yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah for sure um with one of the uh just kind of sticking on I guess like one of the bits of advice you were given in Mongolia just while it's in my brain I want to bring it up was um especially as you were going through deserts and stuff was to try to keep your mouth dry now this is something which I I kind of use with some of my clients when I'm teaching oh. breathing um for runners and the like um they give you a bit of advice to try to keep your mouth dry and also I guess keep you salivating I guess yeah so just um a small pebble you know ideally the size of a you know, half the size of a 1p coin, something yeah. very small, like a, but, but ideally rounded, you know, so it's not sort of uncomfortable, but you put that in your mouth and um, just keep it in your mouth, um, keep it on your tongue. It Try not to swallow got, it. <laughs> yeah, well, you've got something in your mouth that um, it, you, you don't suck on it, it's not boiled sweet, but it does make you salivate a little bit and that helps keep, keep your throat um, you know, moist. Um, but more importantly, it helps you or it helps remind you to keep your mouth shut um, because our mouths are a sort of, a, you know, a wet cavity and there's loads of moisture to lose through evaporation. And if you're losing this moisture through evaporation largely off your tongue, the tongue will then produce more moisture to keep itself wet. So you're just, it's a sort of, yeah. a, you know, it's like a dripping tap. Um, and uh, that's, you know, you can lose a lot. That way. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, from the, the work I do with athletes and stuff is partly trying to get them to nose breathe more, shut their mouth more. Um, and because it's about 42%, you lose about 42% more moisture through mouth breathing than compared to nose breathing. So I um, didn't know the, um, the number. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's like a big amount. And that's one of the reasons why when you see um, uh, endurance athletes who nose breathe, they have to take on much less water than mm -hmm. um, those who end up mouth breathing. So, uh, yeah. Well, just as, uh, an, as an indication of, you know, the moisture coming out of your mouth. Uh, and, and yeah, you, I, I didn't even mention the fact that you exhale moisture. Uh, whenever you see pictures of uh, people in polar regions with a big beard of ice, mm. that's all their breath that's frozen. That's moisture in their breath that's frozen. That's not ice that's sort of come to them. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's come out of them. Yeah. And so, I mean, I definitely want to come on to some of them polar bits in a minute, but um, one of the things that really, I mean, there's a whole bunch of, one of the things um, I discussed with Nick when he did his run or his like round the world run. And then I kind of feel like maybe the two of you, not maybe you've you, you got different, um, I don't know, around religion, I guess. So Nick kind of found when he did his run, like he found a real like, positive feel to religion in the world like as in but i guess it was on a very personal level now i'm not saying you didn't as such but um i think listening to your book you you definitely felt the um how much maybe religion has kind of draw or has torn um certain areas of the world <laughs> and fights and stuff yeah well i suppose i left i left on that particular journey as a sort of relatively indifferent atheist. Yeah. Um, and I came back a sort of confirmed and slightly more vociferous atheist. Yeah. I'm not someone who will corner someone in a pub and start yelling, there is no God, it's yeah. all a lie. That's not, <laughs> that's not really my thing. And, and, I, and I believe it's important that everyone is free to free. believe and practice what they, what they want. That said, many, many religions, in fact, pretty much every religion, is filled with very, very unpleasant, not, not entirely, but is, is uh, peppered, let's say, with mm. a lot of quite unpleasant doctrine and ideas about the place of the role of genders or, or many, many other different things. But I, I do think that 
uh, the more that people are taught and free to learn, um, the less religion plays a role. You know, yeah, yeah. There's there's a correlation between the better educated countries. It's not a, it's not an exact correlation, but it, it is a correlation between countries with better education systems and rates of belief. You know, people look to uh, Finland and New Zealand, for example, as yeah. the places where people are best educated, and also you know, uh, Denmark and Finland, happy places. Um, yeah, yeah. and these are places that increasingly religion doesn't have a role at Not all. Role. Um, and it's, I mean, it's, a, it's something that's difficult to talk about because for one, I mean, to take Christianity, um, people who are, you know, f- full on Christians, hardcore yeah. Christians, um, or, or just, or just, or just, you know, just believe, uh, all of the, you know, revelations, for example, they genuinely believe that everyone who doesn't believe what they believe is going to burn for eternity in a fiery pit, which is an awful thing to think. Yeah, yeah. And that must be on a daily on a daily basis. That must be um, you know depressing or upsetting or, or or even deeply traumatic to think that all these people that you know in life, who you know are good people, but just believe yeah. the wrong thing or don't believe anything, um, are destined for. I mean, eternity is an, is is a literally unimaginably long amount of time. Yeah. And it's one, one of the things that, that I suppose initially might have put me off religion. It's just, <laughs> you know, a lot of people get to that 90 and think, you know what, I've had enough. That's um, enough, yeah. <laughs> exactly, I'll, I'll check yeah. out here, have a good long sleep. Um, and so, it, you know, it, it must be really hard to not sort of, you know, missionize essentially because of that yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. profound belief. And so I, I, I hold nothing against, you know, anyone for their beliefs. It's just, I, I, I suppose, do quietly and sometimes less quietly hope that you know the the, the trends towards um irreligiosity i suppose uh continues but not in a sort of um not in a jarring way yeah, yeah no i mean so you look what russia did for 70 years and now you look at the incredible resurrection of russian orthodox faith because you can't suppress something you have to teach yeah um which ironically is the central thesis of many religions so uh, yeah it's it's a it's a really tricky uh topic definitely but i've seen i've seen many ways in which it's it's incredibly beneficial in people's lives as well but yeah. i believe those benefits can be got through other means. found in other methods. absolutely um i mean i've you know it i there's bits in your book i found almost quite difficult to listen to kind of just because of you know especially going through the middle east going through some of the stands and stuff like that and you know um i've made a few just a few little notes of like um in iran of just you know nine-year-olds potentially being able to marry and you know that because of their what their readings of the quran and whatever else were um and there was a whole there was just a few bits in that when i was kind of listening and just being like oh do you know I mean, you, you can't even get your head around, you can't really get your head around that here. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the exact numbers now. I think it was... It was 9 girls, and 12 or something, I, wasn't it? I think it? it was 9 and 12 for girls and boys, respectively, after the um, Islamic Revolution. And then I believe it was put up... Um, 13 or 15, After, after Khomeini died, exactly, that's right, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so it's not quite 9 anymore, but, um, you know, it, it, it has been. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, there are... There are still parts of the world where there was a very excellent about two years ago um, documentary uh, uh, by the BBC where they went undercover with cameras and managed to find um, uh, imams uh, selling, uh, essentially prostituting girls that were in uh, single figures or very, very young, you know, uh, 11, 12, 13, um, uh, with temporary magic marriages, which is how prostitution is spun in in some islamic countries whereby you're married with an an imam he marries you officially and an hour later the marriage is annulled um which is yeah probably not annulled because i suppose it is consummated but it but but then divorced and and, you know this 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 is rape and trafficking um and uh, it happens today yeah yeah i think that's what i mean you in towards the end of your second book you discuss uh, you kind of go into um well, I'm going to have to look it up now. Um, tra- um, uh, slavery and, and the like um, in oh, Mauritania. Mauritania. That's it. Saying it's, it's, 
it was made illegal in the 80s or 90s or no it was um it said 80, it, i think yeah and then actually yeah. it wasn't until 2007 or something that it was really um there's, there's, re yeah there's still thought to be i think over 100,000 um slaves in in mauritania today yeah i mean i don't know i mean throughout your travels i mean does we're seeing this hearing this reading this um all your travels that you've done do you kind of get the uh, a feeling of hope i guess that perhaps those things are improving or is it almost i kind of feel like at the moment there's especially with left and right kind of swinging left and right further and further and further it's almost as if uh some of those um you know i kind of i guess you look at iran from the 70s after the uh, Islamic Revolution and whatever else, it's if it, you know there's almost a, like this bigger swing back towards conservatism, back towards like that side of things. In your travels, seeing the people on the ground, I know there were some countries where um, there wasn't. And again, you might find this. I guess it's really difficult. You know, your recent travels to Serbia and Russia and the like, but. <sighs> is you know i feel all of these things end up having to change from the ground up um because you know someone like putin's never gonna say no thanks i'm gonna disappear now um but some some of those countries where you we talk they literally that's them do you know what i mean like it's the whether it's um propaganda or whatever else that's what they believe yeah i i, I feel um firstly i don't think there's any reason why any country can't change in any way for good mm -hmm. or bad um there's nothing innate in no. any part of the world or any uh people or genetic sequence or anything like that beyond appearance and i suppose um you know the tendency to be able to you know some some people in some parts of the world are better at long distance running for example due to you know genetic makeup but yeah. to do with like culture i used to be more hopeful more optimistic about mm. the um i suppose the general direction of travel it felt um i mean i'm yeah so i'm in my mid-30s and i feel like i and my generation um and and, and you as well i suppose grew up at an almost unprecedentedly peaceful time in yeah. history and of course that doesn't mean that there wasn't anything happening there were plenty of wars you know in europe in africa you know in in the um in Kashmir, there were there were wars you know all over the place chechnya yeah um but uh broadly speaking the um the trend was of growing and spreading and improving uh democracy and human rights and i feel like in the last I mean, it's tempting to say six years since Trump got in, but I think the rot has set in a little earlier. The last, you know, eight to ten years, I feel like that has that has um, ground to a halt, and now mm. has slowly started to reverse. And it's, I mean, America has just, um, you know, they've just overturned Roe <laughs> Wade, yeah. which is astounding. And 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 um, and you know, I, I presume you might have some American listeners, and I, and I, you know, people might dislike what I'm about to say, but America has just forfeited the right to lecture any other country on women's rights mm -hmm. uh, because reproductive rights are absolutely central to women's rights and privileging the life and well-being of an unborn fetus sometimes just you know four five six weeks old uh, over the life of a mother who might have been raped who might be underage who might mm -hmm. you know many different things who might have a child with a birth defect that's already been detected at an early stage is you know, it, it flies in the face of women's rights. Um, there are so many, I mean, there was this depressing point about a year ago, I think it might have been, I might be wrong here, it might have been with the coup in Myanmar that mm. the world tipped from having majority uh, democracies, whether functioning or flawed, to right. a minority of democracies, whether wow. functioning or flawed. Um, so, and, and it's it's very easy, I suppose, to say, well, you know, how do we know democracy is the right system? But surely it goes without saying that the right system is the system that everyone agrees on, and the only way you can find that out is democracy. And if you want to vote in, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a monster, then I suppose you're welcome to. But if that monster then starts removing people's freedoms, it's no longer a democracy. And if that monster can no longer be voted out, it's no longer a democracy. Yeah. Um, and so I, I actually feel thoroughly um depressed by the the kind of state of 
humanity at a governmental level around the world. Yeah. And with with the um, sort of successive removal or failure of democracies or collapse of democracies um, goes the collapse of human rights because some, a country that doesn't privilege everyone or value everyone equally will inevitably value some people over others. And normally, sadly, that tends to be old people over young people or men over women yeah. or people of one faith over another or people of one tribal identity over another or people of one political identity over another. And, you know, the US isn't immune from this. Britain certainly isn't immune from this. And that's yeah. all, you know, come to an incredible crescendo at the moment. And now we're going to watch it sort of play out again with this crazy <laughs> succession battle that is appealing to a tiny and relatively homogenous, um, you know, portion of society while the rest of us just kind of stare mouths agape. Um, yeah. so yeah sorry long and ranty answer to your question but yeah no. I don't feel particularly hopeful sadly um, and uh, travel uh, makes me feel hopeful in many ways and you know people make me feel hopeful but mm. politics currently doesn't oh it's hideous I mean you know going to let's jump ahead again uh, sort of just up to your most recent thing then just for on I guess on that with let's stick with some depressing um uh <laughs> depressing subject um obviously you, you as you said you went you've just ended up in not just but you ended up in um in jail earlier this year um because you were hiking you were well maybe you can explain it better but you basically were hiking across the siberian northlands i think and um yeah you managed to set off three days before uh Russia invaded Ukraine. Yeah, well, I flew into Russia. I arrived three days before the invasion. Right. Um, I was still in the regional capital, Yakutsk, when the invasion took place. And I had to make a bit of a judgment call. Do I stick with this journey that I've spent, you know, quite a while? Mm, prepared, you know, I, yeah, I, I mean, this is a little different from my bike ride, going in temperatures, extreme cold temperatures. Mm. You have to prepare, you have to gather the yeah, right yeah. kit. I needed funds and, and you know, I, I spent a while putting it all together and I had to ask, do I want to sort of throw all this away because of what's happened, you know, and, and me, me leaving, you know, wouldn't have made a, a statement really. So it was really, do I feel personally safe to carry on? Mm -hmm. And at the time I did, and with hindsight, perhaps I was wrong, but also there's a chance that I had things gone very slightly differently towards the end I might not have ended up in prison had I managed to get a flight one day earlier out of mm. my end destination then then things might have been different but um I was also so far away just geographically so far away from uh Moscow or Kiev that it it felt like somehow that distance uh made things less severe where I was and, and I think with hindsight to some extent it did but definitely not to the extent that I'd expected do you um, think your experience of um everything when you were traveling i.e <laughs> is almost comical in some ways the amount of times that uh the Africans would say to you like no 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 no, don't go that way lions they'll eat you lions and then you know you were just like oh fucking, everyone says that I'm just gonna go and sleep in a tent there do you has your experience of you know everyone saying don't do that. It's bloody stupid. You'll be, you know, that you're definitely going to die. You're definitely going to die. And then actually you just went and did it anyway. And you know, your ability to kind of go where you're kind of, I think you said your fatalism of like, well, if it happens, it happens. I bonk, fall asleep. Do you, was there to a certain degree, some element of being in, you know, Siberian being a bit like, well, he's probably not going to do it anyway. Yeah. I know he's amassing his troops there, but it's probably not actually going to like, you know, I mean, it's probably just a show of power and just a, you know power plan. yeah well, i think everyone thought that um and my i suppose my relationship with risk as is everyone's is constantly evolving mm. um and hopefully developing and, you know growing <laughs> but at the same time like you say you do it, it it does become almost habitual to dismiss um warnings from people who might be less informed you know if, yeah. if 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 you're talking to a uh to take the example of african wildlife for example if you're if you're talking to a game warden at the gates of a national park and he says well we've got about 400 elephant and they tend to hang out in this area here so you might want to avoid that then 
you might want to avoid that yeah whereas if you're talking to just someone in a village who with the you know the the, the best you know intentions in the world says don't go and camp in the bush because you know the bush is a dangerous place and we like to live in houses because it's safe yeah. and if you sleep in the bush then something bad uh could or might happen then that's when you can take it with a pinch of salt um yeah. but in but in russia i didn't no russian people for instance told me um you know you should go home mm -hmm. straight away uh i think i'm not certainly at the beginning i didn't have any messages from home saying you should come home straight away mm -hmm. um as you say you were so far away really when you look at a map where you were compared to as you say kind of russia into ukraine you'd almost kind of feel like that's bad probably a bad analogy but it's almost being like oh well i'm going to cross from like i don't know france into germany and that's you know there's almost like there's something yeah, going well, on down in croatia I I was six time zones away from Moscow. So it, that's, I mean, that's the same as, for Here example, Paris and New York in yeah. time zone difference. Um, although, obviously, I was in the same country, the same political entity. Yeah. I was just really, really distant. You know, I was, I was on the same time zone as Pyongyang, you know, yeah. really far out there. Actually, even one hour ahead of Pyongyang, I think. Um, so it was, yeah, it was just a case of thinking, well, I, I'm... I'm just going to get keep my head down and and get on with this and and sort of see what happens. And so, did it surprise it, you the 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 you know because you talk about <coughs> I think I think it was on Joe Rogan you were talking about it, but like it probably was, but you know how people started like essentially phoning ahead, telling people where you were, and, and you know and almost like the the crazy West and the guys in our country, like mm -hmm. and almost that um, small minded this might be the wrong word, but that kind of fear suspicious. that kind of suspicious nature suspicion yeah like well, did that surprise you being that far and being almost in the middle of nowhere as well i've i've um i've traveled in remote parts of russia before um and i've actually uh twice before this journey been through the russian court system so, so i've got some familiarity with the authorities there um it it didn't surprise once i you know as i got in drips and you know i, I was sort of i guess drip fed occasionally bits of news from outside i wasn't really getting a uh, phone signal occasionally i was able to call my girlfriend and and you know via just on a phone you know without yeah. i didn't have 3g very often i had very little contact with the outside world um but as as the little bits of news came in about you know from the outside because news in russia was of course very different mm. as the news came in from the outside about what was happening in ukraine and particularly when you know the the mass atrocities in butcher and other sort of you know kiev uh, satellite towns came out um and and from the very start the russian state was quickly shutting down opposition voices they you know they closed down the last independent tv station within days of the invasion they brought in a new law about 10 mm. days after the invasion uh implementing a sentence of up to 15 years for anyone Deemed to be spreading fake news about the the military or the or the special operation, yeah, you know, the, as as they called the invasion or the war, yeah, um, and that was basically just a way of silencing journalists. And you know, you bring in a law like that, and you don't really have to do anything else because people realise, oh, if I say anything, yeah, then you know, all dissent was in, uh, pretty much immediately silenced. The first wave of protest that broke out across the country uh, ended with about, I think, eventually fifteen thousand arrests, and after yeah. that, there was basically just not a peak. Um, I mean, it's amazing that so many people, even like when he when they first did bring that out, the amount of people who still seem to complain at that first bit, and then they all just seem to vanish. And then it's kind of like, I mean, that's where I think as a saying, and where you've probably said, you're not that hopeful, you kind of think there was a lot of people who protested and like who tried to say something. And then you kind of go, well, Putin didn't really seem to give a shit. <laughs> yeah, I think um, it was there was a sense at the very beginning where for, for, for maybe two days mm. where it seemed like maybe there'll be a popular uprising because mm. you know, the only way to get rid of Putin short of someone more or less on the inside within his cabal, um, you know, topping him. The, the only way really is for a, a mass popular uprising and, uh, you know, on a smaller scale, Belarus tried that 
a few mm. years ago and it just turned out that his grip on the you know the sort of police state the security state that lukashenko had built up was enough to quash the huge opposition mm. but invading ukraine that, that a country that many russians see or at least saw as a you know almost a sibling state you know a, a you know the ukrainian people are their kin their brethren yeah. um that belief for many has changed through just months and months of insane propaganda about fascism um yeah 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 but, but yeah for a couple of days hope. exactly it seemed like it seemed like russia might rise up and, and do something but it there just weren't enough people who believed what was happening was wrong or felt that there was anything they, they could do about it. Um, and so, you know, quickly the kind of rot set in. And from that point onwards, it, it actually didn't surprise me that the country became more and more suspicious. It just quickly hurtled back to the sort of sense of paranoia, you know, even in small settlements that have nothing to do with all this, just paranoia that must have been there for, for you know, seven eight decades throughout you know from the Bolshevik stalinism revolution yeah. onwards exactly uh, and and that's a culture of people informing on each other or in this case informing on me um and you know everyone's watching everyone again and you know it was it was fascinating and deeply disturbing to to watch that you know sort of you know uh, backslide and you were just hiking were you doing this yeah just just hiking um so you kind of you definitely Absolutely. seemed like you were suspicious, like just hiking through the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, well, so it, it where I where I finished um, and where I was arrested, they said I'd been um, conducting illicit journalism mm. um, for starters, uh, photographing military sites and asking provocative questions about Ukraine. And it turns out where I finished this this port town on the on the Arctic coast called Tixi. Um, Tixi used to be a restricted or a closed area due to kind of security because the whole coast is a border zone. Yeah. Uh, and then in January last year, they declassified it. Right. Um, and that's what um, facilitated my journey. And I thought, great, well, it's, you know, I'm allowed to go now. I'll do it. And in the past, you could go, but it involved a sort of lengthy permit application process. So, you know, I could have gone before, before now, yeah, yeah. now it felt that much more doable and sort of you know legit above all. yeah but they in about 2018 they started installing i didn't know this before i went but they started installing surface to air missiles and, and it turns out that tixi or just outside tixi this kind of military installation is a, a sort of hub of their arctic defense strategy so russia right. is, is paranoid about you know any other nation with a aircraft carrier during summer when the ice is open or even with an icebreaker during winter just kind of coming in from the north um which is mad of course because if you're gonna um if, you, if you're gonna try and attack russia from the north you probably just send some missiles you're not you know it's it's, it's not gonna send faff, you know it's a exactly. lot of faff and money <laughs> yeah it's a really hard place to get to and, and supplying yeah. a war up there for anyone that isn't russia would be basically impossible yeah um you know just, just just to um you know maintain a war effort um anyway i was close to that that um installation and um although they never you know i hadn't been photographing it i didn't know it was there they provided no evidence that i had been but that, well, they don't need to they really doesn't matter. Matter. <laughs> no no so when you're in that situation then so for me one of the things i find most interesting about your whole story from everything from like just jumping on a bike and fucking off and like working it out as you go to um you know taking a boat down the bloody the democratic republic of congo when they're saying don't do that it's the worst bit of river you can possibly do to you ending up say in prison is like the mental place that you must end up being at times and throughout that time when you're you've been arrested you're in prison and like your head must go you know at first you must just think oh it'll be all right that'll this will just pass quite quickly but after a week two weeks three weeks like again with everything and however bad your brain your head must space must have been on some of your travels being in you know a russian jail and you know we know how bad this current government is at dealing with uh uh, people, you know, you look at Boris Johnson's balls up of Nazanin Zaghari's um, thing in Iran, but like, as the time ticks on, how how do you keep your head in a space 
of we'll be all right. We'll get out of this. This will be fine. Can um, you? There are times. There are definitely times when I didn't. Mm. Um, I think to start off with, I had. Uh, I suppose just a kind of an innate faith that it'll be all right in the end. Um, it, partly due to the nature of how they imprisoned me, they didn't give me very much information, and I was given the impression that I'd just be there for a few days. But as the days wore on, and as I then subsequently, uh, two weeks in, I had a, um, uh, I'd hired a lawyer by this point, and I had a court appeal hearing that was immediately rejected. Um, it was after that that I thought I could be here for a really long time. Mm. Um, and at the back of my mind, I was aware of this, this potential 15 year sentence and everything they'd accused me was with was, uh, you know, a perfect sort of, you know, case against me under that new law. Yeah. Um, so there are definitely times where I felt true despair, um, in a way that I, in a sort of long, uh, you know, for, for a protracted period of time that I haven't experienced before. And honestly, and, and I, you know, I should, I should qualify. I was there for a month, you know, mm. it's, 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 it's plenty long enough, but it's also not a long time. It's not 15 years, it's whatever. not 15 years. It's not six years with Zagari Ratcliffe. Yeah. I believe Brittany Grind has now been in prison for four and a half months, perhaps mm -hmm. more. Yeah, maybe coming up to five months. And, um, you know, that, for, for me, I suppose the way to cope with it was to, I'm not sure in the, in the relatively short amount of time I had there that I fully did confront it. Because at no point was I told, right, you've got 15 years or, yeah, or yeah. 10 years or, or whatever. And if I did, then it would be a case of coming to terms with that. But yeah. for me, I was sort of on a daily basis coming to terms with uncertainty. But is that not even and, worse, do you think, sometimes? Well, so within the time frame that I had, if I'd been told at the beginning, you've got one month and mm. then we're sending you home, then I would have, I should think, within about three days, although there would have been bad times ahead, I'm sure, but within about three days, I reckon I probably would have, you know, made my peace with what that was and just got busy with keeping busy and waiting. Um, yeah. Or, Get busy dying. Like yeah. <laughs> get, get busy living or get busy uh, dying. That's it. Uh, a bit um, of Shawshank. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but because it was because I wasn't sure, and not every day, but many days I'd wake up thinking, well, maybe they'll let me go today, or maybe they won't, or maybe it'll be many days or weeks or whatever. That was difficult. And I suppose distraction was given that I didn't know how long it would be trying not to think about it which isn't confronting the problem which is a slightly different thing yeah yeah what was it was how i went about it so i i kept myself as occupied as i could with you know walking laps up and down my cell or doing you know exercises or doing you know i did a lot of rubik's cube and i read a lot and yeah. i wrote a lot although i was always a bit sort of um uh, you know, surreptitious with my writing hiding anything i wrote amongst yeah. other legal papers so yeah, it was it was largely distraction, and I suppose trying to, while I was able to ignore, you know, the 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 problem, which is maybe not the best way to go about it. Um, I guess sometimes you just don't really have a choice, though, do you? I guess you know if you if you are in such 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 uncertainty, like I don't know, I guess <laughs> ignore it for as long as possible and hope it resolves itself. And if it doesn't, then figure out another way around it yeah yeah i think it was just a case of coping until i knew more mm -hmm. and it, it the way things happened it turned out that the time i knew more meant that it was it was pretty much the end you know it was only about two days after i found out i was going home that i went yeah home. Nice. um so I, so did you I, sorry go on no no well, i just i think in in many many ways i got incredibly lucky despite the fact that you know i was banged up in prison i was very very lucky and did you so you know in your um in your in one of the in the first book you, you basically you, you, at one point you kind of are learning some some russian um did having some russian in any way age you what i don't know if when you came back from post travels before going out to russia and obviously your um your triathlon you know down the length of the world essentially um probably brought you much more into that world of things again like you know are you relatively um fluent in russian to us to a degree that you could it helped you in any way or 
you know, was having at least just the pigeon rushing that maybe you had, did that at least give you some kind of, com you know, ability to converse? I think in my head, a bit like what you said earlier, having no ability to converse with someone, especially in that kind of stressful situation, probably make things worse. Well, I, I'm certainly not fluent in Russian. Um, I am, I suppose, uh, sort of... Conversational? A, a long-term beginner, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. You know, I, I, I've got basic basic conversational russian i guess yeah um in the past whenever i've had sort of brushes with the authorities i've just said i don't speak any russian mm -hmm. and that will firstly it frustrates them because they've then got to go through a fact you know a process of, of trying to find uh, someone yeah. to translate and whatever else but the first brush i had with the police on this journey so i, I came across the police after about three weeks and then again about four weeks later first brush I had with the police I uh they, I mean they didn't speak a word of English and we were in a jeep on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere and I was just being polite so I spoke the best Russian I could and we spent about an hour managing to converse you know with some difficulty but we we got there um but that then I think helped or enabled them to accuse me of journalism which is what the first charge was that first time uh, right. as it subsequently was again later uh, because it seems like I can talk with people and therefore I can conduct journalism. journalism uh, yeah, so yeah. It, it helped me, um, you know, language itself helped me meet people and gave me some access to and insight into the lives of people I met. But it also, you know, became a, uh, a problem or at least my failure to hide that yeah, became yeah. a problem later on. Yeah. Um, one of the things I found, um, and it's probably listening to you on Rogan discussing all of this side of things, but also going through your book is your, I mean, especially, I mean, the bit when you were talking in your second book all about uh, Afghanistan, Iran, um, all of Persia, all of the history of all of this stuff. Now, I find some of the history of like this stuff fascinating, and I um, have worked my way through Dan, a lot of a lot of Dan Carlin's hardcore histories about mm -hmm. Genghis Khan and about the Persian, um, the Persian monarchy and dynasty, if you like, um, of Cyrus, Cyrus, Sirius, whatever his name is, however you pronounce his name, um, through. Um, did you? did you have a fairly solid understanding of all like of those histories as you were going through those places or is that stuff you've like, learned since coming back and the stuff you um it was i suppose i um no i, di I didn't know before i first went to iran i, I knew very mm. little about the, the kind of the history and especially the ancient history of mm. iran um it was quite easy to start learning about the um the uh, sort of modern history of Iran, the Islamic Revolution, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are lots of people I met who had lived through it. Yeah. Um, the ancient history, I mean, I visited twice on my bike ride, or maybe three mm -hmm. times even. I visited Persepolis, which was the um, the sort of uh, capital of Darius the Great, and then nearby um, Pasargad, which was the capital of uh, Cyrus, or Kush, Cyrus, as it. they say. Yeah. We say Cyrus, um, Cyrus the Great. Um, I when I was on that long bike ride, I read only paperback books. I didn't have a Kindle, which did mm -hmm. mean at times, I believe once in possibly in Iran, I was carrying, I think, 10 books, which is not exactly <laughs> the way many people choose to bike pack. Yeah. Um, but I found it hard to get hold of books about the places I was in. Sometimes I managed to. Mm -hmm. uh, nowadays, I, I, you know, I do travel with a Kindle, so I'm able to have books about where I'm going to and, and be learning about those places while I'm yeah. there. Um, but I mean, learning about places is just a, a con you know, continual process. Oh, You're never done with it. There's always more to learn. And once you think you've learned everything, then suddenly, you know, you learn something else's else perspective and the whole you know, thing starts again in the same way that, you know, I, I went to school in the 90s and the noughties and I learned various things about British history. And now we're sort of reassessing and deciding that maybe rural Britannia and, and sort of, you know, naked jingoism isn't perhaps the best approach to history. Yeah. And we're kind of reassessing and, and yeah i i think one really neat way of summing up uh historical perspective is the fact that we talk about the indian mutiny of 1857 and uh indians talk about the first great war of independence of yeah. 1857 when the you know the indian people for the first time in a quite concerted effort um yeah and and it, and it you know it had its atrocities on both sides but 
they tried to throw off the colonial yoke and after about nine months of sort of you know well, of, of insurrection as the brits would call it or freedom fighting as the indians would call it uh you know the the mutiny or the independence revolution was put, was put yeah. down the revolution exactly um and yeah that that example has always stayed with me there are plenty of other equivalent examples of just the, the title of something being viewed very very differently uh, yeah. by uh, by different sides well, of, a, of a, an event there's always that thing of uh, history is written by the people who win isn't it so it's kind of yeah. you know being able to look through the different lens um cool um i mean there's there's lots of little pieces little like amazing stories which i mean I really are just I'll, I'll just tell people to read your book or to listen to your book because I mean the thing that got me one of the bits that got me was while you were in um uh, I want to say Congo again I can't remember but anyway you basically got malaria and then yellow fever I think as well um typhoid fever typhoid fever sorry um and then you know <laughs> as a nurse uh kind of <laughs> freaked me out a little bit kind of being um you know given quinine given in, uh infusions just through a dirty needle which you know the blokes just blown the dust off and stuck it in you um does does that stuff like in my head when i re read heard you talk about that was that to me like feels like it would be something which would stick with me afterwards like i'd be because i've previously just as a nurse you know bear in mind we use like clean needles and um you know I've had a needle stick injury where I've been in like taking blood from someone and they've moved or whatever, and it's stuck me. And that kind of for quite a while afterwards, you, you even though you go get your bloods done, you checked in the back of your head, you're just like, Oh my God, what if they've, what if they've got HIV? What if they've got, blah, blah, blah. was that something which kind of stuck in your brain? I think that, I think you'd be more um, prone to that because you're, you're a nurse and you yeah, know yeah. The, the risks. And, you know, I, I was quite naive. Of course, I knew about the risks of, um, you know, HIV and in mm. various different parts of Africa. I knew of the greater or lesser uh, prevalence. Um, there's one city I remember visiting in, in Kenya, just on the, the, just on the edge of Lake Victoria, Kisumu, which has, I think, something like a 40, or at the time at least, it, hopefully it's gone down, but they had something like a 48% prevalence for HIV, which is an astounding, um, it's not real, um, isn't it? very upsetting. Um, but in Congo, firstly, I was so out of it with, you know, I, I was more or less delirious for, for mm. the first part of the week. Um, so, and, and I didn't really have any other choice. <laughs> and once I got better, I had got better. And yeah. so, you know, the, the, the things like this are easier said than done. I think everyone has a different propensity for dwelling on the past or yeah. not. I don't particularly dwell on the past and try not to, um, which perhaps means that sometimes I don't learn from learn learn the lessons <laughs> from my mistakes that I could, and maybe other people are learning more lessons from my mistakes than I am. I yeah. do try my best to you know to take the the important points away. But um, in the same way that several people have asked me since this Russian experience, did I regret it or not? Mm. Do I regret it or not? And I, and I can't fully no. regret the whole thing. No. And the, it's sort of redundant to do so. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. And there's no point agonizing over things that have happened. All I, all I, the only thing I actually do regret from what happened is the stress it caused for, for loved ones. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Um, well, I mean, we've kind of waffled on for an hour already so um i mean like i say i could probably ask you just individually about every single country you went to and you know whatever else but i mean and you probably don't really want to um go on about potentially things of you know planning next but do you have much planned for the for the future i've got a few ideas tucked up my sleeve and, and a bunch of sort of you know older ideas that have been floating around for a while i yeah. don't yet know what what will be next um but uh, i suppose if people follow along on social media absolutely at cw explore then that'll be the best the best place to to find out first what uh, what's in the pipeline perfect um one of the things i wanted to ask was also was do you, did you have you because i know on your triathlon you put a map there's a picture of the map of the road you took essentially now i know completely you probably don't know exactly every road you took on your bike ride but have you got like a have you done like a, a bit of a map idea of like we started from here and i kind of went down through here and i ended up because 
listening like i almost want like what i've been doing for the last two days is like every time you got into a new country i'd be like right go on google maps and i'd be trying to see okay so you're coming out of there come down there um that yeah. was one of the things i just thought would be pretty interesting to see just quite the scale of what you did that's the one uh downside to audiobooks is they don't have the maps and pictures um that you get in a in a published book um, in that case but, i will uh well if you case. hang on one second i can show you some maps um there we go We've got the you know these yeah these yeah oh there screens. we go look there we go um, that's upside down but close <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. There we go. Perfect. Oh, in that case, yeah. I'll just have to get myself a um a real hardback copy or a proper copy as well. Um, um yeah. Yeah. Nice. I mean, I kind of I mean I've kind of said on a couple of podcasts now, partly in a bit like your um Homeric kind of brag, braggadocious way of doing things. Like I've kind of got a bit of an idea because I live um I live barefoot, like basically I just go everywhere barefoot, and I've got a bit of a thing. I want to um run a bit like nick did nick but he ran around the coast of the uk and i want to yep. do the same i want to do it all barefoot and i want to just kind of go and see all of the uk like that so i'm kind of a bit like you i'm kind of figure if i did say it in public then i'm gonna actually have to pull my finger out in the next kind of like year or so and, and do it but um given that yeah. people love going to the beach to get pissed that's probably the highest density of broken glass you're going to find in the country that is on the <laughs> edge of it um probably. but i'm sure i'm sure i'm sure you you know your feet are toughened up and, and you'll yeah. be fine that sounds like a cool adventure yeah hopefully hopefully will be um so as always obviously as i say you are a slightly different kind of guest but kind of i do enjoy kind of chatting to someone like yourself because again from my perspective i learned so much from your books um about history in general about people um uh, you know again it is that thing of i love hearing you talk about places like afghanistan or um iran and stuff especially on your first trip to iran i think you know just how lovely everyone was how friendly you know even in these war-torn places that you're told are the most dangerous place in the world there's always stories of like essentially love and friendship and like you know just giving um so you know if you're going to buy these books, then I would highly recommend it and uh, and get that out of it. But this podcast is called Move, Breathe, Live. And as I say, you've definitely moved. You've probably taken a fuck ton more breaths than most people have. Um, and you've definitely lived more of a life than most of us have. Um, so is there anything, you know, whether it be a philosophical thought process or action or just, you know, a physical thing that maybe you did or can suggest to someone to maybe move, breathe or live a happier, healthier life? Is there something that maybe they could um, take away from this podcast, apart from to buy your books, obviously? <laughs> um, it's a it's a difficult, it's mm. a difficult question to avoid because um, because there's so much wisdom in this area and inevitably a lot of the wisdom in that area various different people have arrived at so it almost becomes hackneyed or cliched yeah yeah and i'll try my best to avoid that but i suppose where i can offer maybe some you know value is on the live side of things because yeah. although i spend a lot of my time moving and going off on journeys you know everyone has different approaches to that and you know going for a for a good walk each day or every other day or whatever is, is you know is, is just as valid as going off for a you know canoe down a river <laughs> um but uh, on the live side of things, I mean, the, yeah, the first cliche that springs to mind is, you know, you'll only regret the things that you don't do as opposed to the things that you do do. And I think that's largely true. But I, I think the, the simple one I'm going to give is, is the world is a much, much, much more kind and nurturing place than we often allow ourselves to believe. And if we, you know, read stories about, um, you know, let's say some despotic or troubled or war-torn African country, those stories are largely relating to governance or mm -hmm. failure of governance. Um, and, you know, the same with America, you know, we hear horror stories about America with all the gun crime and stuff, but America is still, a, although the homicide rates are, you know, many, many times that <laughs> of most European countries, for example, it's still a very safe place with very friendly people. And pretty much wherever I've been in the world, whenever I've got into trouble, and this is often more true of countries you, you would less expect it to be, um, people have just found me and helped me and, and looked after me. And people's default reaction is, is basically kindness and nurturing. Um, and it's very easy to become cynical about the state of the world if you, 
you know, again, here's the cliche if you just read the news and the papers. Um, but but actually your average person wishes you nothing but goodness, even if they don't yeah. know who you are. Yeah. Amazing. Well, I mean, I think that's kind of whenever I read any of these kind of, you know, a travel adventure, exploring type things, that's probably one of the main things I, I always take is, you know, just actually, you know, that that thread of humanity is actually much stronger than I think. Um it's easy and especially as you say when everything's as um maybe as crazy as it is in the news and also as like you know as you say if we're sitting watching boris fight it out with jeremy hunt and whatever else or whatever you know you kind of it's very easy to just see the the good in people because most of those people seem to not be that great but um yeah the the day-to-day -day people always just seem to come through pretty well um well thank you so much for giving me your time today it's been an absolute pleasure to actually get to talk to you and to talk about some of your stories and like i say there was i've literally got a list i was just i kept making notes about different places and um but if anyone wants to find you as you said you're on instagram and socials at cw explore correct your website cwexplore.com com com um and yeah you can see everything that charlie's doing on all of that stuff there so i'll put it all in the show notes so you guys can check it out um i can highly highly recommend his books he does read his audio books as well so that's well worth uh listening because now you've heard his voice it'd be shit if somebody else read it so um yeah thank you so much for this mate it's been an absolute pleasure it's been a lot of fun thanks for having me on no worries thanks mate